Hi, everybody. This is Peter Schiff, and welcome to the very first Schiff Radio podcast. For those of you who are not familiar with me or the Peter Schiff Show, let me give you a little introductory background so you have a little idea about where I'm coming from and the origins of this podcast. So I, my name is Peter Schiff, and I am in the financial business. Um, I make my living selling financial services predominantly. I have a U.S.-based broker-dealer, Euro-Pacific Capital, as well as a Canadian-based broker-dealer, Euro-Pacific Canada. I have an asset management company, Euro-Pacific Asset Management, which recently, and I'll talk about this uh, in future podcasts, I recently moved my U.S.-based asset management company from uh, California to San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, but Europe Pacific Asset Management uh, helps me manage money on behalf of my clients around the world, not only my clients in the United States or Canada, but clients uh, of my offshore bank. For those of you who are listening to this podcast from outside the United States, and I know we have a lot of listeners or we had a lot of listeners to the daily radio show from all over the world, which was one of the unique aspects of my show was its global appeal. Uh, But I also have a bank in the Caribbean, Euro-Pacific Bank, and we sell financial services uh, to our clients around the world. So that's mainly what I do for a living. Now, I, I rose to some level of prominence as the 2008 financial crisis erupted, because that is an event that I had been warning about for years. I warned about it extensively in articles that I wrote, uh, which I published on my website for my broker-dealer, Europac.net, and I disseminated them to hundreds of reporters, uh, a print, TV reporters uh, around the world. My analysis of the situation at the time, I really began writing once a week in about 2003-2004 time frame. All of those articles that I wrote there, and, of course, they're on various other websites that posted my, my commentary. But the entire archive is there on my brokerage site, europac.net, E-U-R-O-P-A-C.net, for anybody who wants to read what I was writing back then. But I was very vocal, and I, I, I was prolific in my writing and my warnings about how current monetary policy combined with uh, other government regulations, Fannie and Freddie, things like that, that the policy was inflating a real estate bubble of epic proportion and that the entire economic recovery rested on the foundation of that bubble. And that when that bubble burst, and I said that it would, it would uh, send shockwaves throughout the financial system and the economy. We'd have a financial crisis. Banks would fail. Fannie and Freddie would go bankrupt. And I wrote that that would usher in the worst recession since the Great Depression, We'd have 10% unemployment, trillion-dollar deficits. I finally got around to writing a book, which became a bestseller, Crash Proof, How to Profit from the Coming Economic Collapse. That book came out in February of 2007. But also, I was a regular fixture. Uh, I appeared far more regularly back then than I do today on Fox News, on uh, CNBC, CNN. And in all of these interviews, I was out there... Uh, talking about the the phony recovery, the problems that the Fed was creating, and this looming economic crisis, this financial crisis that was waiting in the wings. And I generally did so to the scorn, ridicule, and laughter of everybody else who was being interviewed with me. Well, after it hit the fan in 2008, somebody uh, put together a compilation of just some of my television interviews, and they created a video, a 10-minute video, called Peter Schiff Was Right. And that video ultimately garnered more than 2 million views before the person who put it up eventually shut his YouTube channel. And now that the original video is no longer there, there are various copies of it. We put up a copy ourselves, but it doesn't have near the 2 million-plus view count that the original had. But that really made me more popular. A lot more people found out about me and then they got my book Crash Proof and read that. And I also 
got a little bit into politics in 2008, I had been a, a big supporter of Congressman Ron Paul. I had been a supporter of his my entire life. I had voted for him when he ran for president uh, as a libertarian. And this is, you know, back when he was running against uh, Bush Sr. And I was even, I followed him when he was a congressman from Texas long before he became a, uh, a presidential candidate. So I, I, I always supported Ron for his unique um, you know, libertarian, free market, constitutional, sound money understanding. In fact, my father followed him, you know, before I did. And, and so when he announced that he was running for president in, in 2008, I was very excited about that and I wanted to help him and I, you know, raised some money for him, donated to his campaign. And eventually they uh, named me as an economic advisor to the Ron Paul 2008 campaign. So that was kind of my first really entree into politics and kind of as a result of that and as a result of some of the fame that I got on the internet there was really a there was a movement like a ground swell a uh, grassroots movement to draft me to run for senate myself against the then incumbent Chris Dodd who of course chaired the senate banking committee and who was famous for talking about how sound Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were when I was on television roughly at the same time saying they were going bankrupt right so it was going to be a very good contrast between the guy that helped create the financial crisis and the guy that warned about it for years and his warnings fell on deaf ears and in fact, back then, I was getting a lot of media attention. I did, you know, a lot more interviews in the States then than I did now. So there was a big movement to draft me. People set up websites. They started uh, donating, you know, to the shift for Senate campaign, even though I wasn't a candidate. And ultimately, I, I decided to run. And I entered the primary and lost. I came in third in a three-way race, although... I didn't do that bad. For a first-time candidate, I got 23% of the vote. The guy that came in second got 27%. But he had been a congressman for Connecticut for you know a dozen years. And before that, he was in the state legislature. So he had a lot of support and name recognition, a guy named John, uh, Rob Simmons. And you know Connecticut had five districts. He beat me in his district. But I actually came in second place in the other district. So I actually came in second in a lot of the districts in Connecticut, including the district where I live. But of course, we both ran against Linda McMahon, who steamrolled over us. She spent $30 million in the primary uh, to my three and a half or so. And about a million of that came from me and the other two and a half million I raised. Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people contributed uh, to that campaign nationwide. I had loyal supporters basically dialing for me, not only from all over the United States, but from all over the world, uh, people were dialing on behalf of my campaign. And who knows if the media had not totally blackballed me, nobody covered my campaign. I did get the backing of all the Tea Party groups in the state, but ultimately they did that too late. And, you know, Linda McMahon outspent me 10 to 1, but she only got twice as many votes as I did. And she ended up spending another 20 million 50 million total. She lost the Senate race in 2010. Then she spent another 50 million to lose another Senate race in 2012. But I didn't want to throw any more good money after bad or ask people to donate to another failed campaign. But after I lost the 2010 campaign, I still wanted to be active. You know, I wanted to be involved. I wanted to find a way to make a difference. I thought maybe I could make a difference if I was a senator. Uh, but I thought, well, maybe a talk show host. Maybe I can be more influential if I hosted a syndicated talk show. I had already started doing a weekly show that was on shortwave um, and online called Wall Street Unspun. And I started that program years earlier as kind of a way to stay in touch with my client base, which had been growing. And I wasn't able to talk to all of my clients on a regular basis, certainly weekly, but I wanted all my clients, I wanted to encourage them to tune into this weekly show. And it was one hour on a Wednesday night and it was Wall Street Unspun. I said, you know what? Instead of doing one hour, one day a week, why don't I do a show every day? I did a two hour show live. I set aside a big block of time and I committed to doing a two hour show Monday through Friday, the Peter Schiff show. I wanted a syndicated radio show and I did it for four years. 
Ultimately, we were carried on about 60 stations or so. Uh, but after doing the show for four years, I decided that it really wasn't gaining the level of success that I had hoped. It had a loyal audience, but it wasn't big enough. And it was a huge commitment of time for me to have to be at this mic every weekday for two hours. Uh, it took a lot of my time. It really interfered with my ability to travel. And so it became more of a burden. And yeah, if I could have you know, gotten to the level of a Rush Limbaugh or Glenn Beck, it would have been a burden worth bearing. But since I wasn't doing that, I thought, you know, let me try a different tact. And the idea for this podcast was born. It's easier for me to record it. I could be, you know, it's more flexible. And when I do it, I'm not as under the pressure from the radio stations to constantly do a live show at this time. And so the idea of the podcast was born. So my very last radio show was last Friday, the Friday before Labor Day weekend. And now we are recording the very first of the Peter Schiff podcast. So I hope you enjoy this new format and more importantly, share it with your friends. The key here is to build a real grassroots movement. I'm gonna put out a lot of information. I'm gonna be talking about the markets, the economy, politics, and I'm gonna be doing it in ways that very few people do. In fact, if you wanna get some samples, you can go to the website shiftradio.com and you can listen to some of the old Peter Schiff shows to see my unique take on all of the topics, you get a lot of propaganda, you get a lot of left-wing spin on the major networks, and even a lot of the right-wing conservative talk show hosts really don't get it. They really don't understand economics the way I do. They don't understand the markets, and they're more just hacks or shills for the Republican Party. And that's not me. I mean, I'm going to criticize Republicans as much as I do Democrats, even though Democrats in general make more mistakes uh, both parties get it wrong more often than they get it right. So you're always going to get the unbiased truth listening to the Peter Schiff show on this new podcast format. So sit back and I hope you enjoy the first of what may be many, many podcasts in the weeks and years to come. You make no friends in the pits and you take no prisoners. No prison. One minute you're up half a million in soybeans and the next boom. Your kids don't go to college and they've repossessed your Bentley. Are you with me? The revolution starts now. Starts now. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Turn those machines back on! You are about to enter the Peter Schiff Show. Show me the money! If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on Earth. The Peter Schiff Show is on. I don't know when they decided that they wanted to make a virtue out of selfishness. Your money, your stories, your freedom. The Peter Schiff Show. Well, we got a lot of economic data this week, but the most significant data point of the week came out on the last day of the week, on Friday, we got the non-farm payroll numbers for August. And, you know, before the number came out, everybody was so optimistic. Yes, we had had six months in a row of more than 200,000 jobs created each month. And everybody thought that this was going to be the seventh month, right, of plus 200,000. The consensus was 230,000. The lowest estimate that any of the Wall Street analysts had was 190,000. Nobody was lower than that. And I think the highest I saw was 310. Some guy was so optimistic, he had 310 as his number. So everybody was optimistic. In fact, all throughout the week, uh, it was the economy is doing well. Everything is great. We're creating all these jobs. And so when the August number came out, everybody was shocked. Although everybody but me and maybe a few other people that have their heads on straight. But the number came in at just 142,000 jobs. That's it. And they actually revised down the last couple of months. I forget how much, maybe 30 some odd thousand. So it was even worse because not only did this number significantly miss what was expected, but they shaved down uh, some of the numbers from prior months also the bad news got worse when you look beneath the headlines the labor force participation rate went back down to 62.8 
which mass matches the lowest level since 1978. So more people left the labor force. The labor force shrunk. The number of people in the labor force went down. The unemployment rate did notch down to 61.1, I mean to 6.1 from 6.2. But again, it's not because those unemployed people got jobs. They just left the labor force. And when you leave the labor force, you're not counted as being unemployed, even though you're not employed, right? So that helps out the government. It, it pads the statistics. But those people who don't have jobs and who are not being counted as being unemployed are not productive. They are not contributing any economic output. In many cases, they're draining off the system. They're on welfare or food stamps or disability or whatever they're collecting. Uh, or maybe they're committing crimes, but they're not uh, contributing to economic output. They are detracting from it. Hours work, uh, you know, wages, you know, basically flat up slightly. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm sure that whatever meager wage increases people managed to eke out didn't even keep pace with the true rate of inflation, the, the rate by which uh, the cost of living is going up. So this was a horrible jobs number. And of course, it, the minute it came out, all the talking heads were on CNBC, the usual suspect of economic idiots. Uh, Diane Swank, who, you know, when CNBC used to have me on regularly, I had many a debate with, with Diane Swank. And if you really want to see how foolish she is, go to on the YouTube channel and, 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 and YouTube Peter Schiff, Diane Swank, and watch some of the run-ins I had with her in years gone by. But she basically said, oh, I don't believe these numbers. This is an outlier. She said, I'll believe this number when pigs fly. And, of course, you know, pigs are never going to fly, so she's not going to believe the number. Mark Zandi of uh, Moody's, I guess, or whatever. What is it? He, he, Moody's.com. He kind of, you know, he's, ne he's just a total cheerleader, Mark Zandi. Uh, and he didn't believe the numbers either because he was expecting a big number. Diane Swank was expecting 270,000. So she was above the consensus. And, and so she was way off. And so that's why she doesn't want to admit she was wrong. So she's saying that the numbers are wrong. She thinks that they're going to have big upward revisions uh, next month to this number. Why does why do all these economists want to you know throw out these numbers? It's because they're still clinging to this fantasy of a recovery. You know they they've they've mis mistaken this mirage for reality. But you know what happens? You know you see this mirage in a distance, and the problem is you don't realize that it's not real until you you're close enough to touch it. Right? Maybe you're you're in the desert and you're dying of thirst and you think you see this water off on the distance and then when you go to close enough to drink you've just got a mouthful of sand and that's what's going to happen to the people who think they see a recovery in the distance or around the corner or something like that because it isn't there and i believe rather than an aberration right this bad jobs report is a sign of what's going to happen in the future it's a trend change i think the aberration was the last six months of sub of above 200,000 a month job creation. But of course, you know, when the experts talk about the number, oh, we created 200,000 jobs, it sounds like a lot of jobs. But of course, it's really not. We're a population of over 300 million. We need almost 200,000 jobs every month just to create jobs for the new people who are entering the labor force or who should be entering the labor force uh, every month. So that's not really enough. I mean, or barely enough to basically we're treading water. But more important than that is the quality of the jobs, because it's just a number, 200,000. It doesn't tell you 200,000 what, right? Are these guys engineers getting a job with a high salary and benefits, or are they working part-time at McDonald's making French fries? You see, the jobs number doesn't differentiate because the job's a job as far as that number is concerned. And when you actually look at the data, we've actually been losing the good quality jobs and we've been replacing them with low quality, low paying, part-time jobs, temporary jobs. Because see, when they report the jobs numbers, that's the net, right? Some jobs are destroyed and some jobs are created and they tell you the net. Well, it turns out that so far in 2014, uh, if you just you know, break it up, we've actually lost full-time jobs. So when the president talks about, oh, we've created 200,000 jobs a month, he's talking about part-time jobs. 
because those are the only jobs we created. We actually destroyed full-time jobs. And the, the part-time jobs that we're creating are paying a lot less, not only on an hourly basis, but the people that have these jobs only get to work part-time. So their income is way down. So, you know, in fact, when the president talks about the fact that we, you know, we finally this year regained all the jobs that we lost in the Great Recession, no, we didn't regain the same jobs. We lost good jobs, high paying jobs with benefits, and we replaced them with crappy, low paying jobs, part time jobs, temp jobs without benefits. It's not a even exchange. And in fact, some of the jobs, the same guy has multiple jobs. Let's say you used to have a full time job and now you got two part time jobs. Well, that counts as two jobs, even though the same guy has both. He'd rather have one full-time job, but he can't get that. So he settles for two part-time jobs, and now the president takes credit for creating an extra job. In fact, one of the reasons that there are so many part-time jobs is because employers are trying to change the nature of their workforce because they want to get out from under the requirements of Obamacare. And so they have to get rid of a lot of their full-time employees and replace them with part-time employees who don't subject them to these requirements. So now people have to moonlight. They have to get two jobs. And now, you know, they don't get paid driving from job A to job B. It's a pain in the butt, thanks to, thanks to President Obama. But also, you know, when, when you're looking at the, uh, the, 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 uh, the quality of these part-time jobs, these uh, temporary jobs that are being created, and you compare them with the jobs that were destroyed, these jobs are not going to deliver real purchasing power. They're not going to deliver the tax revenue to the government that they used to. In fact, a lot of these people that have these low-paying jobs are still on public assistance. They still might be collecting food stamps or some other type of government support because the jobs that they were able to land uh, don't deliver the type of purchasing power. And part of the problem, too, is a lot of these part-time jobs are going to people who would rather not have them at all. You know, it's one thing for the president to brag about jobs being created. But what if the job is being created for somebody who doesn't want to work? What if the person would prefer leisure? A statistic that no one one talks about is that the only real age demographic to be gaining jobs in this Obama recovery are 55 and older. And a lot of the people are 65 and older or 75 and older. Why are all these elderly people who should be enjoying their golden years on the golf course, playing shuffleboard, you know, walking on the beach, why are they all in the workforce? Well, because they have no choice. Because all the inflation that the Fed has created to try to stimulate the economy by goosing asset prices, higher food prices, higher electric bills, And by keeping interest rates at zero, so our seniors are getting zero return on their CDs, they can't pay the bills anymore. They've been forced by circumstances to enter a labor market that they left. They don't want jobs. So older Americans that don't want jobs have them, but their grandkids who want jobs can't find them. And so now they're living uh, with their parents. And not only can't they find jobs, if they can find a job, by the time they finish paying taxes in their student loans, There's nothing left, and they still can't afford to get out from under uh, their their parents' roof. So the job situation is much, much worse than the numbers suggest. And I think it's going to get a lot worse. The Peter Schiff Show. We ain't asking. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the disappointing jobs numbers. And, you know, it's probably not going to get the media coverage that it deserves. Because, again, they're going to dismiss this as an outlier. You know, after the numbers came out, uh, not only did you have the talking heads on CNBC, you know, that's what I was watching at the time. Although, you know, there's not that many other people watching CNBC beside me. I, I saw an article that showed that their Nielsen ratings have just hit a 21-year low. 
You know, so despite the fact that the Dow closed at a record high, which it did today, and I'm going to talk about that later when I do a segment on the markets, but despite a record high in the Dow, you've got 21-year low in CNBC viewership. Why is that? And again, I've said this before, this is a stock market rally for the 1%, right? The average American who was in the stock market during the 1990s, they're too broke to invest in the stock market now. You've got some wealthy people that are involved, but the vast majority of Americans, uh, you know, they're spending their money in the supermarket, not in the stock market. So they couldn't care less what's going on with the Dow. See, the Federal Reserve just doesn't get that. They think they're going to build a recovery on inflated asset prices, but the consumers they're trying to stimulate are too poor to afford the assets that they're inflating. So you're getting record low viewership on CNBC, but, you know, I'm still watching, right? But anyway, um, so they had the Secretary of Labor, Thomas Perez, came on to put his spin on the jobs numbers. And, of course, he said, oh, everything is fine. The recovery is on track. You know, he wasn't bothered at all, at least publicly, by the much weaker than expected job numbers. But what he did mention is he said, look, you know, what the recovery is lacking is consumption. He said it's a consumption lacking recovery. We really need more consumption and we need to put more money in people's pockets. As if the government has the ability to do that. I mean, sure, it can print money. But that doesn't do you any good. The money doesn't have any purchasing power until something is produced, something is created. Now, of course, his solution was that's why we have to raise the minimum wage. And, you know, I'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, they had more strikes this week. Uh, fast food workers want $15 an hour, right? The president has opposed, proposed 1010, which apparently is coming up for a vote in the Senate. And it may well pass in the Senate. But, uh, Perez said that's, what, that's what's going to put more money in people's pockets, a higher minimum wage. Of course, uh, some people will have the money picked from their pockets because when the minimum wage goes up, uh, they're going to get a pink slip instead of a raise. And so they don't get more money. They get no money. Uh, but Labor Secretary Perez can't figure out that, that simple, simple economic fact. But the, the, the economic principle that he doesn't understand is it's not consumption that the economy is lacking. We're already over-consuming based on our means. The problem is we lack the means because we lack the productivity. We lack savings and investment and economic output. That's why we can't consume because we don't produce. We have to borrow right now to buy the things that we don't produce. So the truth of the matter is we don't need more consumption. We need less. We need to live within our means and we need to save. But what Perez wants us to continue to do is buy things that we can't afford with money that we don't have and have to borrow from the rest of the world. That is not going to grow the economy. The only way to really put purchasing power in the pockets of American consumers is to make those consumers more productive. We need to have more economic output, and that's what creates real demand. It's legitimate supply. Government programs cannot do that. Now, what government could do is get out of the way and repeal the minimum wage. That would be productive, as well as a lot of other rules and regulations that stifle economic growth. But they're not concerned with economic growth. They're concerned with getting votes. And it just so happens that the type of legislation that undermines economic growth gets a lot of votes. And so it's the politics that win out. And in fact, the politicians win twice. When they pass laws and regulations that hurt the economy and destroy jobs, they also get more voters because the voters don't connect the dots. They don't realize that they're unemployed because of government or they're underemployed or they're, the inflation is eating away their dwindling paychecks. They don't blame the government, but they expect the government to solve the problem and they keep voting for the politicians who promise to solve it, even though those are the same politicians who are causing the problem that the voter is hoping to solve with his vote. So it's a twofer for the politicians, right? They get votes and then they undermine the economy and they blame that on capitalism or, you know, lack of government. And now they have more dependent people who have lost all hope and who are now going to vote for somebody promising something for nothing. So it's a win-win and it's not going to end until there is a massive economic crisis. But, you know, another interesting thing that Perez talked about. And this is because he was interviewed by another fool, Steve Leisman. So it was, you know, you know, one fool interviewing another. Neither of them understands economics, despite the fact that Steve Leisman is the senior economist 
at CNBC. I'd hate to, you know, uh, you know, hear what the junior economist uh, has to say if we get, you know, if the senior knows so little. But he asked Labor Secretary Perez if he was worried about the Japanese or the um, Europeans debasing their currencies. And if this was going to be a problem for America, because it would hurt our our exporters and maybe hurt jobs, which, of course, is nonsense because he just got finished. The labor secretary just said we need to put more money in the pockets of Americans. And that's exactly what the Japanese are doing and the Europeans are doing. When the Europeans force the euro down, they are stealing purchasing power from their citizens, Europeans, and they are giving it to Americans. That's what's happening in Japan. When the Japanese say they want a weaker yen, That means they want to take purchasing power away from their citizens and give it to Americans because they want the yen to go down against the dollar. They want Americans to be able to buy more stuff and they want the Japanese to buy less stuff. And that's what's going to happen. And so actually in that in that way, we are putting buying power in the hands of Americans, but it's not the U.S. government that's doing it. It's the Japanese government or the European government, and they're stupid for doing it. They are undermining their own citizens and they don't even understand it. And they're temporarily subsidizing Americans so that we can keep buying things that we can't afford with money that we didn't earn. Right. This is what is going on now. At some point, uh, the Europeans and the Japanese are going to see the error of their ways. And we're going to talk about these errors because obviously the Europeans uh, are still clueless, as are the Japanese, based on current economic policy. But, you know, a lot of the jobs, a lot of the job creation that we did get over the past six months, you know, yes, a lot of it was part time, temporary jobs. But where did it come from? I think what happened was a lot of businessmen have been fooled by all this recovery talk. A lot of people are expecting this big recovery in the second half. And so in anticipation of this recovery, some businesses have hired more people. Or they haven't laid off as many people. They've even stocked up on their inventory because they think they're going to sell it. A lot of the big uh, GDP number that we got in the second quarter, apart from being held over from the first quarter because of the weather, there was a big buildup in inventory because you have businessmen that are expecting this big recovery because they've been told by so many people that it's coming. uh, and, And so they've actually prepared for it. So they've, they've loaded up on inventory that they think they're going to sell. They've hired people they think they're going to need. Well, I think when the second half turns out to be a major disappointment, which has been the case for several years in a row now, a lot of businesses are going to find out that they hired people that they don't need, that they stocked out on inventory that the consumer is too broke to afford. And I think you're going to see a big decline in the GDP in the second half, and you're going to see a commensurate decline in employment and a pickup in the unemployment rate. And so, again, far from being some kind of one-off outlier that we can ignore, uh, the numbers we just got for August are more likely the beginning of a trend and that the first half of the year was the aberration as people prepared for a recovery that doesn't really exist. And, you know, there was economic data that that came out during the week that, again, was better than expected. Uh, we got um, the um, ISM non-manufacturing numbers were better than expected. We got factory orders a little bit better than expected. The trade deficit com- came out not quite as bad as expected, but still over forty billion. It was still a it's still a bad number. I mean, just because it wasn't as bad as people thought it would be, but nobody really cares about it. But you know, the PMI service index again these these numbers were giving false hope. I think to the optimists, the bulls who think there's a real recovery going. It's not here because if you actually look at the data, look at the housing market. In fact, the only data we got. Uh, from mortgage percals applications came out on Wednesday, it was bad. And the housing market to me looks like it's rolling over, right? And, and, and so if the Fed is building this recovery based on the housing market, based on rising home prices, home prices aren't rising anymore. In fact, they're starting to decline. Sales are starting to decline. I think the air is coming back out of that echo bubble that the Fed was able to create. But if you look at the anecdotal evidence of the consumer like, you know, 
one I think is a good indicator is this summer box office, which you know was the worst box office in about 20 years. Why are Americans not going to the movies? Because they can't afford it. It's, they're saying the movies are bad. They're not bad. There are plenty of good movies came out this summer. International box office was up. I think the problem is people can't afford the tickets. You know, I went to the movies uh, not too long ago. I paid $13 for myself. This wasn't even 3D. And my kid was $11. He's 11 years old, under 12. It's 11 bucks. I mean, that's still a lot of money. I remember when the, uh, an adult ticket was $4 and a kid was $2. Well, there, $2 was a big deal because it was half price. Now it's 13 for an adult, 11 for a kid. I mean, pretty soon it'll be, maybe it'll be 18 for an adult and, I mean, 20 for an adult and 18 for a kid. I mean, what big, you know, it's going to be 10% off. It's hardly, it's hardly anything. So you got a couple of kids, you got a wife, then you want to buy popcorn, some sodas. I mean, it's a $50, $100 experience. Um, and that's assuming you eat at home. You know, you don't eat it in a restaurant. So I think people can't afford, they're staying home. All the other evidence, I think that the consumer is tapped out, buried in debt, He's lost his home equity. He no longer has a stock portfolio. He lost his full-time job. Now he's got a crappy part-time job. Inflation is eating away his purchasing power. They're spending all their money on electricity and food and gas. There's nothing left over for anything else. Yet all these uh, analysts on Wall Street you know, sit back from their penthouse apartments uh, and just assume that everybody else is living as large as they are because their stock portfolios are hitting record highs. The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the other major news story of the week was the surprise decision on the part of the ECB to reduce rates. Now, first of all, the short-term rates at the ECB are 15 basis points. That's 0.15%. So you're talking almost as low as you can go. And if you look at long-term bond yields, 10-year yields, below 2%. And if you look at some of the other countries in Europe, like Spain and Italy and France and even the UK, which is not part of the Eurozone, but you know, just it's there. If you look at the rates on government bonds, these are the lowest rates European governments have been able to borrow at in centuries, centuries. You can go back hundreds of years and the kings had to pay higher rates of interest. And you'd figure, you know, a king is pretty much good for the money that he borrows because he could pretty much take whatever he wants from his subjects. But these are the lowest rates in anybody's lifetime. Yet somehow these geniuses at the ECB are looking around at all the problems in Europe and they've decided the problem is that rates are too high. That 15 basis points is just too big a hurdle for the European economy to jump over. So they came up with a brilliant idea. Let's reduce rates, right? Let's take them down to 0.005. You know, when you only have one trick, I guess you keep repeating that trick, whether you get any applause or not, right? You got one tool, it's a hammer. Everything is a nail, you keep banging. Even if what you're banging is not a nail, well, I'm gonna pretend it is because I just got a hammer. And so they're gonna lower rates. They took the deposit rate, which went negative for the first time, right? It's already negative. So once you're punishing people for making a deposit, right? Once you got a negative interest rate, does it really matter how negative it is if it's negative, right? I mean, it was negative 0.1. Now it's negative 0.2, right? I really don't think it's going to make much of a difference. But they did it anyway, right? That's the definition of insanity, right? Central banks all suffer from economic monetary insanity they all do the same thing over and over again even though it doesn't work if lowering interest rates in europe were going to revive the european economy it would have already worked going from 0.15 to 0.005 isn't going to make a difference yet everybody acts as if it's going to yep that's it 
There's a businessman. I was, you know, I wasn't going to borrow money because 0.15 is just way too expensive. But now that you've reduced rates to 0.005, well, sign me up. Where's that loan? Where can I sign? I wasn't going to hire somebody. But now that you drop rates from 0.15 to 0.005, yeah, I'm ready to hire. The only thing stopping me from hiring was those 10 basis points. I'm glad you uh, gave them to me. Unbelievable. Also, the ECB uh, signaled that they're willing to expand their balance sheet. They didn't really commit to any kind of formal QE yet. I guess that's still coming. But they talked about expanding the balance sheet by another, what, 700 billion or so euros, whatever it is. I'm not really sure. Some big number. Their balance sheet, though, would still be smaller than the Fed's balance sheet is right now, even after the expansion. Even though the European economy is larger, the GDP of the Eurozone is larger than the GDP of the United States, yet the ECB's balance sheet is not nearly as big as the Fed's. And of course, the Fed's still growing too. We will get to that again a bit later. So they came out and surprised everybody with this rate cut. Everybody expected rates to stay the same. Now, they're still practically the same because there's really no practical difference between where the rates are and where they were. They were insanely low and they're still insanely low. Uh, But when it happened, the euro dropped at least 2%. The euro went down back below 130, below 130 for the first time all year. It wasn't too long ago that the euro touched 140. And of course, the Europeans panicked when that happened. Oh, no, this is a disaster. We got a week in the euro and they deliberately tried to talk it down because they were afraid that if the euro went up, their consumers might catch a break and they might be able to buy more stuff for less money, perish the thought, right? They all want inflation over there in Europe, just like they do in the U.S. and Japan. But now we're below 130. We closed the week at about 129 and a half. Now, of course, the euro didn't just go down against the dollar. It went down against just about every other fiat currency on the planet, except maybe the Swiss franc, which plunged along with the euro, Uh, because the Swiss were dumb enough to tie their currency, peg it to the euro. And I'm going to talk later in the show about why that might come to an end in November, because you've got a very important vote coming up in Switzerland on on requiring gold backing for the franc or more gold reserves. I'll talk about that later in this uh, in this podcast. But so this is not about dollar strength as much as the commentators might want to talk about a strong dollar. It ain't a strong dollar. It's a weak euro. Right. The dollar's weak, too. It's just not as weak as the euro right now. Long term, the dollar's going down against the euro because why people are so optimistic on the dollar is because they assume that while the ECB is easing, our Fed's going to be tightening. What they don't know is while the ECB is easing, our Fed's going to be easing even more. Whatever the whatever QE is going to happen in Europe, it's going to be happening bigger in the United States. So all this talk about a tighter Fed, shrinking the balance sheets, raising rates is a bunch of talk. What's actually going to happen is going to be the opposite, although not lowering rates because they're already at zero. We beat the ECB to zero, uh, but it's going to be QE, a bigger QE than the one that they're talking about ending, the one they're about to rev up is going to be bigger. Remember, I, I, I said at the first time when they launched QE, I said we're going to have more QEs than Rocky movies. And I think we've had three or four QEs and there were five Rocky movies. So I think, you know, we got we got more to go. Um, And of course, you know, those Rocky movies got worse as they made them. Um, That's what normally happens with sequels. They're they're worse than the original. And so that's the same thing is going to be QE. The the later QEs are going to do even more damage and they're going to be even bigger bombs uh, than the the earlier QEs. But what is the goal of these European politicians? What do they say they're trying to accomplish by, you know, lowering rates and printing more euros? What they're trying to do is save Euroland from deflation. Really? Seriously? That's what they're worried about? All the problems in Europe and the one that keeps the European bankers up at night. They wake up in the middle of the night in a hot sweat. And it's because they don't think consumer prices are rising fast enough. That's what worries them. I mean, that's the least of the worries for the actual Europeans. According to the ECB, the inflation rate or consumer prices are only rising 0.4%. And they think that's too low. They want prices to rise by 2%. Well, why is prices going up by 2% better than prices going up by 0.4%. 
I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'd rather have prices go down than up. I mean, if I'm shopping, I want to get a good price. I mean, everybody shops for the lowest price. That's the whole point of comparison shopping. Nobody looks for the highest price, except maybe central bankers. They think we all want higher prices. We don't. We want lower prices. Why do we want lower prices? Because if prices are lower, we can buy more things. See, when prices go up, we have to restrict our our consumption. Because if we have to pay more to buy things, we can't afford to buy as much stuff. See, there's the irony. They want to stimulate consumption by making consumer goods more expensive. That doesn't work. These idiots couldn't even operate a, a, a corner store. You don't stimulate consumption by marking your stuff up. You have a sale. You want people coming in the door and spending? Lower the prices. That's what drives demand. Obviously, people don't have unlimited amounts of money unless you're a central banker. So if you have a limited amount of money, the lower the prices, the more stuff you can buy. It's that simple. And in fact, if food prices are going up and energy prices are going up and you're spending all your money just surviving, well, you got no money left over for luxuries. Now, if prices came down and if eating was cheaper, if my electric bill was lower, hey, maybe I have some money left over. I can go shop, right? But these idiot politicians are worried that inflation is too low and they want to make inflation go up. Now, why do they think that forcing Europeans to pay more money for basic necessities, why do they think that's going to reside, revive the economy? You got me. You know, somehow they think that inflation is going to cause businesses to hire people or consumers to spend more money. I don't know why that would be the case. In fact, I think it's the opposite. But these people think that if they just create inflation, that they're going to get economic growth and they're going to get jobs. Have they ever considered, what if they're wrong? What if they're wrong? What if they end up with more inflation, but they don't get more growth and they don't get more jobs? What if all that happens is they compound the problems of a weak economy, and now they've got high inflation to boot. Then what? Then what do they do? Because now you've got higher inflation and you've still got all the unemployment and the economy is weak. Now, if you think that you need low interest rates to help the economy, if inflation ends up going up, what if instead of 2% inflation, which the ECB claims they want, what if they get three or four? What if they overshoot to the upside? What are they going to do? Are they going to jack interest rates up to 5 or 6% to bring that, on, that inflation rate back up? How are they going to do that? What if they're still in recession? What if they still have all this unemployment? How can they do that? Or are they just going to let the inflation get worse and make it a bigger problem? See, inflation doesn't solve your problem. It compounds your problem. You put yourself in a bigger predicament. And this is the predicament. It's not just Europe that's going to be in this predicament. It's going to be Japan. It's going to be the United States. We're all making the same bet. We're all going to have to line it. We're all betting the farm on inflation. We're going all in on this trade. We think inflation is our salvation. It's our damnation. I said in the beginning, a nation that lives by QE will die by QE. And what I mean by that is that once you build a phony economic recovery on QE, you can never take it away. Because the minute you do, the recovery implodes and you're in a worse position than you were before you started it. But if you recognize that fact and you continue QE indefinitely, then you will destroy your currency and it's the equivalent of an economic overdose. You take too much drugs and you you die. And death in this case is a currency crisis, a collapse in the currency, collapse in the bond market. And ultimately, that is where we are heading. I got more to talk about. Uh, not just about the European economy, but about our economy, the U.S. economy, because we've got the same problem. We're making the same mistakes here. Our Fed is in an even bigger box than the ECB. Now, what are the actual problems in Europe? Because they have nothing to do with interest rates being too high. If anything, it's rates being too low that are counterproductive, that are screwing up the economy. Certainly in the United States, that is the case. And it's not that inflation is too low. In fact, the European economy, given how weak it is, would benefit if prices were actually falling. If consumer prices were actually coming down, that would lubricate the economy somewhat. That would ease the pain of a weak economy from the perspective of people actually living in that weak economy. 
But no, the economists and central bankers have concluded that the problem lies in rates being too high, despite the fact that they're practically zero, and they're not being enough inflation. And so they're determined to create more inflation, which, as I said, is not going to solve any of the actual problems. It's just going to compound them. It's just going to add another problem on the pile of problems that already exists. But what is really going on in Europe is that there is too much government. Why do you have so many unemployed people? Because the governments, the politicians, European politicians who want to get votes, want to appeal to employees not employers, because employees outnumber employers. Most people do not have what it takes to start a business, to employ people. The majority of people just want to take the easy way out. They want to collect a paycheck. They want to show up and be told what to do and know that if they do what they're told, at the end of the week, they're going to get paid what they've been promised. It's much more difficult to be the business owner. Because no one tells you what to do. You have to figure it out for yourself. And you have no idea what, if anything, you're going to make at the end of the week. Because you don't have a salary. Nobody pays you. You pay yourself. And you only pay yourself after you've paid everybody else first. All your employees have to be paid. All your contractors, uh, suppliers, your landlord... If you borrowed money, you got to pay interest. So you got to pay everybody. Only if there's something left over do you get paid. And in many cases, there's nothing left over. In fact, in many cases, certainly when you're starting a business at the end of the week or the month, you've lost money and now you've got to write a check. You've got to dip into your savings and you actually pay to work. And of course, nobody works harder than the business owner. I mean, if you've got a job and you think you're working long hours, check your boss, see how long your boss is working. Chances are in most companies, the boss is there first thing in the morning. He's the first person to get there and the last person to leave. And he works weekends. You know, maybe he's not even there. He's at home. He's working. And when he's on vacation, he's working. So usually the boss works the hardest, although the employees don't appreciate it. But the politicians know that if I want to get votes, employers are not the place to go because there's not as many of them. I want the votes of the employees, so how do you get votes? You promise employees something for nothing. I'm going to force your employer to give you this and give you that, and I'm not going to let him fire you, and if he does, he's got to pay you this or he's got to pay you that, and I'm going to mandate this benefit and that benefit. And so you pile on all these rules and restrictions, and the employees love it, and they vote for whoever promises this stuff, but now what happens? You're an employer... And you don't want to have to deal with all this. You don't want all this baggage. You don't want all this responsibility. You don't want all this liability and all these costs. So what do you do? You don't hire people. You hire as few people as possible. You outsource. You automate. You, um, you, know, you, you hire independent contractors. And so this is the problem with European labor markets. The unemployed aren't unemployed because there's not enough inflation or because interest rates are too low. There are too many rules and regulations that are regulating people out of jobs. And of course, taxes are also too high. Taxes are a big burden. And why are European taxes so high or American taxes or Japanese taxes? Because the governments are spending too much money. So what do they really need to do in Europe to solve the economic problems? Cut government spending and repeal rules and regulations. But they don't want to do that because all the spending and all the regulating is designed to get votes to keep the European politicians in office. So they have to pretend they're going to do something about the problems they've caused. And so they rely on the central banks to do it. But there's nothing the central banks can do but create inflation. And that is not going to solve the problems. But hey, the politicians really don't want the problem solved. They want to pretend they're trying to solve them so they can get the votes of the unemployed and the underemployed and the people on welfare. And in fact, The more their policies backfire, the more economic damage their policies do, the more, you know, despair they create, the more dependency they create, they hold themselves out as the salvation and they get more votes and they vilify the employers and capitalism and say, see, we need more government because the economy is so bad. You can't get a job. Government is going to help you even though the reason the economy is bad and the reason they can't get a job is because of government, right? So it works perfectly for these politicians. You know, also on the the topic of inflation, you know, I read this article this week 
about shrinkflation. You know, it made me think about, you know, the Seinfeld episode, shrinkage. And what do they mean by shrinkflation? Because right? they're trying to say, well, we don't have inflation, we have shrinkflation. And shrinkflation is when the company, instead of raising prices, they just reduce the quantity of what's in the package. Right? And they're saying, so we don't really have inflation yet, but it's coming. Because, you know, first there's shrinkflation and then there's inflation because first the company is going to try to hide the price hike by cutting quantity. And then, you know, because it's only so small, you can make your packages, then they raise prices. And so they say that shrinkflation is a harbinger of the inflation to come. No, it's not. Shrinkflation is inflation, although rather both inflation and shrinkflation are the result of inflation, which is the expansion of the money supply, which is growing rapidly all around the world. And that's why uh, companies are raising prices. Whether they choose to raise prices by diminishing quantity or putting a bigger price on the same quantity, that doesn't make a difference. It's the same thing. I'll give you an example. Let's say, uh, you know, Kellogg's decides for a box of cornflakes, instead of raising the price by, you know, 10%, they're just going to put 10% fewer flakes, flakes in, the, in the box, right? And so they don't raise the price. And they say, well, that's shrinkflation. Well, no, it still costs you 10% more, even though they haven't raised the price. Because assuming that you don't reduce the amount of cornflakes you eat in a serving, you still pour the same amount of flakes into the bowl before you you know, add your milk and whatever you put in there. If they put 10% fewer flakes in the box, well, you're going to have to buy 10% more boxes throughout the course of the year. So you're still spending 10% more money on your, uh, on your flakes, right? So it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Raising the price or diminishing the quantity, so you have to buy more of the product. And of course, they've done this. I mean, I remember when I uh, was a kid, and you know, we would go shopping, and my mother would always let my brother and I pick the cereal. And of course, we picked the cereal that had the nicest prize. That's really what we looked at. We looked at the cereal boxes, and we saw which cereal had the best prize inside. Because they're all, you know, they're almost the same. It was they're almost like, you know, you know, candy in a box, right? So we would pick whatever chocolate candy type cereal had the best prize inside. And so the minute we got home, we couldn't wait. You know, we couldn't wait for the prize to just fall out of the box. So my mother would have to open up the box of cereal, and then we would have to empty the contents into these big bowls, looking for the prize inside. And I remember that the boxes were filled to the top. I mean, you know, all the way to the top. Uh, the bag inside was was full of cereal. Now, you know, I go shopping and I buy some cereal. Of course, I try to buy some healthier types of cereal today, although I don't eat a lot of cereal. But I notice that you have a big box, but the minute you open the box, there's a bag inside. And the actual cereal, it maybe it starts halfway down. Sometimes it's even less. I mean, you got this huge box and you've got this tiny amount of cereal inside the box. So they don't even make the boxes smaller. They just put less and less cereal. And so you're, there's an illusion, oh, I'm going to buy this big box of cereal. But of course, not only have they reduced the quantity, but they've increased the price to boot. So you get it both ways. But all of this is happening. It's the result of inflation. They have this in Europe, European businesses. This is all BS that prices are not going up. Prices are going up. It's just that those increases are not being fully captured in the indices that the government chooses or the central bank chooses as a measurement for uh, prices. And now they want to pretend, even now they lie about inflation, uh, they report it as less than it really is, and now they complain that there's not enough of it when they're the ones that lied about it, and now they say we need more inflation. The real reason that Europeans want inflation, the same reason that American politicians want inflation, is because they've made all these promises to all these voters that they can't keep and they have all this debt and they have no integrity to admit they can't pay and default because the tax base can't afford to pay the bill for the promises these politicians have made to get votes. So what do they want to do? They want to inflate the obligations away. They want to inflate away their debts and they want to create the illusion of prosperity because they want numbers to be bigger. They want prices for stocks and real estates to be higher and they want wages to go up even if it's only nominal, even if your wages are going up more slowly than the cost of living, they think we're dumb enough to believe 
that that poverty is actually prosperity. All they're concerned about is their own political future and the money they're able to earn uh, in office. For the future enslavement of all unified nations, which is like rats in these cages, then they start the inflation on anybody that has no blood relation. The Peter Schiff Show. And a combination of political leaders who meet in private conversations. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies. Another example of how politicians try to buy votes from workers is the minimum wage law, which is perfect for politicians because you have a large segment of voters who do work for the minimum wage. And then you have a politician promising to give these workers a raise. Vote for me and you're going to get a raise. Now, that's very appealing for people, right? Hey, if I vote for this guy, I get a raise. Everybody wants a raise. And if you're the politician who's against increase in the minimum wage, then the way you're perceived by that worker, that voter, is if I vote for this politician, I don't get a raise. He doesn't want me to earn more money. But here's another politician who wants to give me a raise. Who are you going to vote for? Obvious, right? The guy who's promising you a raise, especially if you don't understand much about economics, which is probably the case for most people who are earning the minimum wage. If they knew more, if they were more intelligent or more learned, if they had more experience, they would understand that it's a bunch of empty rhetoric, that a lot of people aren't going to get raises, they're going to get pink slips. But the typical minimum wage worker doesn't understand that concept. He just knows that there's one guy promising to give him a raise, and there's another guy promising not to give him a raise, and he, he wants to vote for a raise. I mean, he's smart enough to know he wants to earn more money, right? He's not that dumb just because he's on the minimum wage. And, and so it gets a lot of votes. It gets votes all over the world. That's why so many countries have a minimum wage. You know, one of the few countries that doesn't have a minimum wage is Switzerland. And these guys were almost dumb enough to impose one on their own because there was a, an initiative on the ballot that went down. It was going to put a minimum wage in Switzerland. It was going to be the highest in the world. It was going to require the payment of about $50,000 a year. That was going to be the minimum wage or 48, something crazy like that. And the Swiss had the good sense to vote it down. But there is another initiative that the Swiss are going to be voting on. I believe it's November 30th. So it's coming up. And that would require the Swiss franc or the Swiss National Bank to have 20% of their reserves in gold. Now, Right now, they only have about 8% of their reserves in gold. Of course, about 10 years ago, they had a much higher percentage of their reserves in gold because, A, their reserves were much smaller. Right now, they have about $500 billion in foreign exchange reserves, which if you consider, you know, there's only about, what is it, 8 million or so people that live in Switzerland. This is an enormous amount of money. Um... It's about, it's over $60,000 per person. You know, that includes infants. So if you look at a family of four, uh, each family has over a quarter of a million dollars in foreign exchange reserves. 
basically parked at the Bank of Switzerland. That is ridiculous. Think about that. Think about, you know, you know, Americans, right? We all have a huge share of the U.S. national debt, right? Each American family is in debt, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, each Swiss family has a credit of hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's just sitting there, right? Why? You know, obviously, the Swiss would be a lot better off if they didn't have all these foreign exchange reserves. And instead, they had the extra purchasing power in their own pockets, which they would if the Swiss weren't buying up all these euros to keep the Swiss franc from rising. But 10 years ago, they didn't have anywhere near the enormity of reserves they have now. Plus, they had a lot more gold because the idiot bankers in Switzerland sold half their gold. When gold was, what, three, $400 an ounce or less, they sold half their gold, right? So this initiative would require Switzerland to bring their gold holdings back up to 20%, which would require an enormous amount of gold. They would have to buy, what, $70, $80 billion worth of gold. I think they have a certain number of years to do it. More importantly, too, I don't know if it's more importantly, but certainly important, it would require all that gold to be held in Switzerland. It would require Switzerland to repatriate any gold that has held abroad, whether it's in uh, the UK, in, in the United States. They have to bring it back to Switzerland. And I think a lot of the gold that's been leased out, they would have to call in those loans. So that is also going to be problematic and certainly very bullish for gold if they have to bring all their gold home and they have to have uh, this 20% backing. You know, Switzerland, by the way, was the last country to officially sever its currency from gold. And maybe they'll be the first country to reconnect the two. And of course... All the bankers and politicians hate this. They're saying, oh, we can't do this. It's going to handcuff the the bank. Exactly. They need to be handcuffed. These guys are reckless and irresponsible. They've pegged their currency to the euro. And so when the euro plunged on Thursday following the surprise rate cut, the Swiss franc plunged right along with it. And now, you know, the Swiss have to continue to pursue these bad monetary policies. They have to continue to debase their currency along with the Germans. I mean, why did Switzerland not become part of the euro in the first place? They could have abandoned the Swiss franc and officially had the euro. They didn't want to. They didn't want to abdicate their monetary policy to Brussels. They didn't want to give up the strong Swiss franc in favor of some unknown euro. I mean, yes, the Deutschmark had been strong, but the euro is not the Deutschmark. It's also the Italian lira and the Spanish peseta and the Portuguese escudo and the French franc. They didn't want those currencies, but now they got it anyway by default because they were afraid to allow their currency to appreciate when everybody wanted to bail out of the euro. But of course, that would have benefited the Swiss more than a mountain of foreign exchange reserves does now. So the Swiss are fighting back. They want to force their politicians to act responsibly. They want to force the central bank to have at least 20% of their reserves in gold, which isn't a lot. I mean, 20% is not a lot. If you look at a lot of the other European nations that are out there, they have 50, 60, 70% of their foreign reserves in gold. Look at Germany, look at France, uh, look at the Netherlands, even the United States. A lot of these countries have very, very high percentages. Switzerland is down to 8%. Now, of course, there are other countries. I mean, officially, China's at 1%. I mean, unofficially, who knows where they are? But I mean, you can look at Taiwan or Singapore, these big countries that are huge, have huge foreign reserves. Their gold holdings are like 2%. I mean, all the major central banks uh, really uh, in the de- in the developing world need to buy enormous quantities of gold to get their percentages up. See, the big countries like you know France or Germany, they haven't been intervening to suppress their currency, so they don't have the enormous foreign exchange reserves, so their gold reserves are a much bigger percentage of total reserves. But all the countries that have been intervening, you know, they've been fighting the currency war, they've been trying to keep their currencies from going up, they have enormous reserves, and they haven't been buying gold because that doesn't suppress your currency. You have to buy other fiat currencies that you're trying to depress your currency against. But- if the Swiss vote right and they and they vote for some handcuffs, you know, they're saying this compromises the independence of the bank. They're not independent. They're a bunch of morons. They're working in concert with other central banks. Independence lies in restraint, lies in tying your currency to gold. So you're not at the whim of these bankers and, and, and whatever they feel like doing. 
But if the Swiss uh, successfully, uh, you know, if they vote to pass this, it's a big game changer because now they're not going to be able to buy up all these euros. The Swiss are not going to be able to maintain this 120 relationship with the euro uh, because in order to do that, they'd have to keep buying lots of gold because they'd have to keep buying lots of euros. And every time they bought, you know, uh, euros, if they bought, you know, 80, you know, if there has to be 20%, every time they buy, you know, four euros, they need to buy some gold or whatever the, the relationship is going to be. Uh, they're not going to be able to do it, not without pushing the price of gold up dramatically. So this is a big deal. Watch for this Swiss vote. They voted the right way on the minimum wage. They voted that down. Let's see if they vote the right way on the gold uh, initiative as well. And they vote that one up and they relink, uh, they reconnect the Swiss franc to gold because the gold standard serves Swiss, Switzerland well for a long time and it's going to serve them well for a longer time if they re-embrace it and go back to the concept of a sound, strong Swiss franc. And they need that because you know they've their banking se- sector has been hurt by the fact that we've screwed up all their secrecy and their privacy by finding them and forcing them to turn over all their information to the U.S. government. So at least they got to get their strong Swiss franc back because if you can't get a private secret account in Switzerland, at least you can get a sound currency. And right now you don't get that because when you put your money in Swiss francs, you've in fact put your money in the euro, which means you're in the Italian lira. And who would want to do that? And I want to you know, also circle back on the minimum wage because it was in the news again this week in the U.S. because we had all the protests again at the fast food restaurants where workers are you know, demanding $15 an hour for, um, for their work. And of course, if this happens, if there is some actual requirement that they get paid $15 an hour, whether it's a mandate or who knows. You know, recently there was a court ruling, or now is that a court ruling, the government decreed it, um, that if you are a franchisor, you're still responsible for any employees of the franchisee. So even though you have no direct control over their working conditions or their wages, that you're still responsible and liable. You can still be sued. So if I work for a McDonald's franchisee, I can still sue the franchisor. Now, that wasn't the case in the past. So if this holds up, this makes it very dangerous for these uh, restaurants. And and, But if they're successful in implementing this, what is it going to mean? Is it going to mean that all these unskilled workers and the teenagers or even the young adults or even if you're, you know, even if you're 30 or 40 and, you know, unfortunately, you're trying to raise a family on an entry level job, which you shouldn't be doing. Uh, but does it mean that all these people are going to get paid $15 an hour? Absolutely not. A lot of them are going to be paid nothing because they're going to lose their jobs. They're going to be replaced by machines. And instead of people serving you when you go to a fast food restaurant, you're going to serve yourself. Just like a gas station, right? At one time when you went to a gas station, um, you didn't pump your own gas. There were people there that did that for you. And they also checked the the level of the fluids. They checked your oil. If you needed that, they put it in. They filled up uh, your, your, um, your tires with air. They washed your windows. They did all the stuff that you do yourself now, right? And they took... They, they, they took your money, they brought you change, and generally you said, keep the change, and that's what these guys made. And, and it wasn't like gas was expensive. I still remember my father pulling into a gas station and a full-service gas station, they do all the work, and then you know, you know, know giving the guy $2 and saying, keep the change, and that was his tip. But he got all his gas, and it wasn't even two bucks, right, because gas was like 25 cents a gallon, you know? Uh, and so gas was cheap, and you got a lot of service. Now you pull into a gas station, there's no human beings there. You know, there's just machines. You swipe your credit card, you pump your own gas. There's a bucket of water and suds. You want to wash your windows, you do it yourself, right? That is the American experience today. We don't get the service we used to get. And of course, young kids don't get the opportunities they used to have. They used to be, you know, pump jockeys, they call them. But, you know, uh, in between Phillips... All these gas stations used to have mechanics. They had repair shops there. It wasn't just gas. They also did repairs. And so you got a job pumping gas. And after a few years, you learned how to be a mechanic. Why? Because you were an assistant to another mechanic. And then you became a mechanic and now you earn more money. And eventually maybe you opened up your own filling station and you had a chain of them. You made a lot of money, but you started off pumping gas for tips. Well, now that opportunity is closed because of minimum wage. Well, what's going to happen to these fast food restaurants? 
pretty soon they're going to look just like these self-serve gas stations. It's going to be self-serve fast food. You're going to come in and some machines, some robots are going to prepare the food. It's going to come down some conveyor belt. You're going to swipe your credit card or your, you know, your, 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 an app on your iPhone. It's going to pay. You're going to take the food to the table. And then when you're done, you're going to dump the, the stuff in the trash, maybe wipe it down. And you're going to leave. That's it. You're going to do it all yourself, right? And all these jobs are going to get eliminated. You know, it's the minimum wage law is 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 getting rid of all the services. I mean, what happens at an airport? Do you have porters now to carry your bags? No, you put money into a machine and now you have a cart. Although now people don't even need carts because now all the uh, the luggage has wheels. And so you wheel it around yourself. You don't have to pay a porter. I mean, all these jobs that were limited by the minimum wage. You know, do you have ushers in theaters anymore showing you to your seat? No. You do it yourself, right? You don't, you don't, you don't have that. You know, at one time when Americans would go shopping, when you would go clothing shopping, if you were a woman and you went into a boutique, you would sit down and models would, you know, would, 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 would wear the clothes that you were interested in, in seeing. Oh, let me see that one. Let me see that one. And somebody would, a model in the store would put on the dress and model it for you. And you would decide, you know, which ones you want. And while you sat down, they might feed you, uh, you know, some food or something. They don't do that anymore. You go into a store, you know, there's hardly anybody there. You can barely get any sales help. You got to do everything yourself. You take stuff into the fitting room yourself. You try it on. And if you like it, you bring it to the counter. You check out. I mean, all of these service jobs, why do you think so much stuff now is assemble yourself? You buy stuff, you take it home. You know, you, I mean, all of the service uh, jobs have been destroyed by mandates and regulation and all the opportunities that used to go along with these jobs are gone as well. And you can thank the government for that. You know, they're, they're going to blame the free market for all the poverty and the big gap between the rich and the poor. It's got nothing to do with the free market. The free market would lift all the boats. Unfortunately, the government is not letting that happen because it's interfering with the tide, with all the regulation and the mandates. Under the guise of trying to help us, they're hurting the very people uh, whose votes they're trying to get. The Peter Schiff Show. Well, it was a holiday shortened week here in the United States. Monday, the U.S. markets were closed in observance of the Labor Day weekend. And so the markets got started on Tuesday, and it was a tough day in the gold market. We sold off early in the morning. We did have some news that came out. Uh, PMI Manufacturing Index and ISM Manufacturing, both those numbers came out better than expected. The, um, the what should we call it, the PMI Manufacturing Index came in at 57.9. That was just slightly ahead of the 57.8. But the I think it was the ISM Manufacturing that was the bigger beat. Yeah, that was supposed to come in at about 56.8. It came in at 59. So, you know, all these little data points coming out a little bit better than had been expected, although the housing numbers, the construction spending, of course, actually came out worse. The market kind of overlooked that. But I think the markets are still grabbing at some of these uh, economic straws where the data comes in a little better than expected. And this was negative for gold. So maybe this was a catalyst, although sometimes, you know, gold just sells off and it doesn't really have much of a catalyst at all. And so that did some technical damage. And then on Thursday, right, gold tried to come back a little bit on Wednesday. But on Thursday, when the ECB announced its surprise rate cut, you know, gold didn't really know what to do. I mean, it started to rise a little bit. And normally you would think this is bullish for gold because they're, they're going to print more money. They're going to create more inflation. That means Europeans need an inflation hedge. But often... Uh, gold trades opposite the dollar, not always. And I think the dollar strength, that was the flip side of the euro re weakness, spilled over into the precious metals and other commodities because, you know, oil prices were also quite weak on the back of the weak euro. And so that hurt gold prices. Now, when we got the jobs numbers that I've already talked about, the much, much weaker than expected jobs numbers, there had already been some technical damage done to the gold market. So gold did, you know, eke out a six or so dollar gain by the end of the day. But I believe had we not had the big drop earlier in the week and had we not had the surprise rate cut 
from the ECB. I think the dollar would have tanked on this horrible jobs number. The only reason it didn't, I think, was because some of the technical damage that had been done. And maybe a secondary reason is that so many people do not believe this number. They're so married to the um, recovery scenario that they're almost refusing to look at any every, any evidence that would cast doubt on that. So they're going to immediately dismiss a number like that as an aberration, an outlier, or one-off event. And so I think we're going to need more than just one bad jobs number uh, to convince some of the bulls that they've got it wrong. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what your perspective is, um, we're going to get we're going to get that string of bad numbers. And so at some point, the bad news is going to sink in. Meanwhile, bad news was good news because the Dow did manage to finish the week up. It closed up just under 70 points on Friday. NASDAQ up 20 points. This is the highest close ever for the Dow. So it's a record high on the weaker than expected payrolls numbers. Dow is now up about... 4% or so on the year. I mean, it's not a big year. It's nowhere near as big as what all the experts were forecasting at the end of 2013, early 2014. But we are positive. But not, you know, the broader market is really doing worse. If you look at the Russell 2000, that index is basically flat on the year. And of course, once you start looking at the internals, there are a lot of stocks that are down 20, 30% or more in calendar 2014. So this has not been a great year for U.S. stocks, right? Some stocks have done well, uh, but some stocks have been, you know, taken out, you know, behind the woodshed and shot. So it all depends on the ones that you own. And of course, international markets, foreign markets have way outperformed the U.S. thus far in 2014. These are the markets, you know, that I'm concentrating in, the ones that we're investing in for our clients here at Pacific Capital. So the international markets are doing a lot better. That's not a story that's really being told too much in the mainstream media, but that is the case. And I believe that will continue to be the case, not only for the balance of 2014, but for the balance of the decade. I think you're going to see a lot of underperformance in the U.S. market as there is more and more interest abroad. In fact, we ha- we at the end of the week, they announced the IPO of Alibaba. And this is probably going to be the biggest IPO ever, ever. It's a Chinese company. If you don't know what Alibaba is, uh, it's well, pretty much it's everything. It's kind of like a combination of Amazon and eBay. In fact, Alibaba processes more transactions each day than Amazon and eBay combined. But it actually started out as kind of like a, beta, a B2B portal where Chinese manufacturers would basically market their wares all around the world. And if you were, you know, an American company and you needed some stuff, you can go on Alibaba and figure out, you know, which Chinese company made the stuff that you wanted and then you could place your order. So that's how it started. But it kept growing and it, you know, and it became its own version of eBay and its own version of Amazon. And it's, you know, probably the biggest e-commerce site out there. And they're going to raise rumored now because the IPO is still a couple weeks away. The roadshow is starting next week. And that's where, uh, you know, the representatives of the investment bankers bring these Alibaba representatives around to all their institutional clients talking about the company so they can get a bunch of uh, orders. You know, they call these things, you know, the dog and pony show, the road show. But it's rumored to be a $24 billion IPO, which would be the single, the biggest IPO ever. And it's going to list on the, the U.S. It's going to be a U.S. listed. It's not going to list in Hong Kong. Uh, it's trading here in the United States, although I'm sure a lot of the orders are going to be coming out of Hong Kong. But they want to be on the U.S. market because that's where you're going to get the biggest valuation. I mean, we overvalue everything. And so if you want to IPO a, 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 a dot-com company, you know, Wall Street is where you want to, where you want to bring it. But um, $24 billion, but they're valuing Alibaba, the market cap at that level, because they're not even selling that many shares. In fact, the biggest seller is Yahoo. Yahoo's going to put about $8 billion cash, I think, in its pocket uh, out of this uh, uh, IPO. But um, the market cap is going to be about $150 billion for, uh, for Alibaba. And I think that will make it the, I think it's going to be the fourth most valuable 
internet company, right? Behind Amazon, um, Google, and Facebook, I think. I think it's number three. Maybe it's even going to be number two. I'm not, I, I'm not positive, but it's going to be more valuable than eBay. It's going to be more valuable than, than Twitter and you know a, a bunch of other companies. But here's the interesting thing about Alibaba. At the price they're contemplating bringing it public, it's only going to be at a PE of 40. Now, I say only because, you know, 40 is still a high multiple. I mean, it's certainly a bigger multiple of earnings than your typical stock. But if you want to compare it uh, to a Facebook, you know, Facebook is, I think, 80 times earnings. So it's at a 50% discount to Facebook. And they've got bigger margins. They're mar- I read that the margins are 45%. These are huge margins. I mean, they're maybe like triple what eBay's margins are. Uh, so this is a highly profitable, fast-growing company in the biggest market in, in, in the world, China. So this is probably going to be a hot IPO. I mean, I'm sure the, I, I, whoever's lucky enough to get these shares, even though it's huge, right? I think it's gonna, there's going to be a pop there. And again, though, but what this is showing is I, I think it's gonna, there's going to be more and more interest international. I don't know long-term where this stock is going to go. I mean, these IPOs are always dicey in the, in the short run or the long run. I mean, maybe there's going to end up being a lot more competition in the China internet space uh, for Alibaba in the future. But this company got started, I think, in the late 90s, 98, 99. So it's been a long time uh, waiting for this IPO. And unlike a lot of U.S. IPOs, they are very profitable. They are making a lot of money. This is a big, uh, vibrant e-commerce behemoth. What it's worth, it's hard to say. But, you know, if I was going to be in this space, I would much rather be, let's say, in an Alibaba than an Amazon, you know, or an eBay or, you know, I mean, Google, Google actually earns a lot of money. Google doesn't trade at a high valuation like some of these other companies. Google is really a money making business. A lot of these other businesses that have come out in the U.S., a lot of these social media sites, they're just pie in the sky. They're just hoping to make a profit, even though they never will. I talked before on the radio show about that company, Coupons.com that just came public recently in the last year or so or two, I forget. But they actually got started at the same time as Alibaba back in the late 1990s, yet they've yet to make a profit. The company is over 15 years old and it's lost money every year in its existence, yet somehow it can still go public. But at least Alibaba is a viable profit-generating company. And I think, look, there's going to be a lot of interest in this and maybe this might spark more interest in the China market in general, the success of... Uh, you know, this uh, Alibaba IPO, which is coming. But more and more money is going to be focusing on the foreign markets. And, you know, our market keeps going up. You know, we've had small corrections, nothing big. We had the last correction that we had was only a few percent. And it was cut short. Why? I believe it's the Fed. I believe that everybody knows that the Fed is there, that the market can't move significantly down without jeopardizing the recovery. Because remember, the recovery, if you believe it's even here, is built on an asset bubble. It's built on stock prices going up and real estate prices going up, even though uh, the latter are basically now starting to fall. And that's already worrying the Fed. They can't have the stock market going down too, because the Fed believes it's the wealth effect from rising asset prices that drives economic growth, even though it's not working. They think it's working, even though it's enriching a few people at the expense of a greater number. It's all they got going. And so if the stock market were to come down, the Fed would have to respond with more cheap money. So how can it go down? And of course, if the Fed actually was going to do what it's threatening to do, if it actually was going to turn off all the QE and start raising interest rates and shrinking its balance sheet, then the market would collapse. And if the market did collapse and if the recovery is built on the wealth of the stock market, if the stock market collapses and all that wealth goes away, well, we're right back in recession. And what is the Fed's playbook to get you out of recession? Monetary stimulus. Now, they're not going to be able to cut rates because they're already zero. And or if they've raised them slightly, you know, oh, they've raised them back to a half a percent. You don't have a lot of room to go down. All they can do is launch another massive round of QE. That's going to make the Europeans blush. It's going to make the Japanese blush. Because, you know, every time the Fed does QE, they got to do it bigger, right, than it was before. They got to go big, right? 
or they go home because every time they stimulate the economy with QE and they create this artificial uh, boom, as the bus goes, when they take away the stimulus, in order to reflate that bubble, in order to get everything going again, they need a much bigger dose. They have to come back with a much greater quantity of QE. And then, of course, at some point, you reach the point where you overdose. And I've been calling that where you, you give the economy so much QE that you destroy the currency. And then instead of getting the high, you come crashing down right? to reality. It's like economic death. You kill your currency. Instead of stimulating your bubble economy, you destroy your currency. And that is where I think we're headed. Because I think the next dose of QE which the Fed is going to launch at some point when it realizes the economy is slipping back into recession and that the recovery has eluded them once again, they're going to come back with Janet Yellen at the helm and it's going to be all in, right? The biggest dose of monetary stimulus the world has ever seen. And, uh, you know, and, it, and it's going to be a collapse. And that, that is also what's holding up the stock market. But you got to realize nominal gains in stock prices won't mean anything. If Consumer prices end up rising much faster. If the cost of living rises much faster than the value of your stock portfolio, you're not getting richer, you're getting poorer. But politicians, you know, they count on people not figuring this out. But I think more and more people are going to be avoiding the U.S. market, avoiding the U.S. dollar. But, you know, if you're going to be in the U.S., if you're limiting your investment horizon to U.S. assets, well, then you got to be in stocks because there's no place else you can be. You can't be in cash. You can't be in bonds. Bonds are even worse than cash. So what are you going to do? I mean, I don't think you want to buy real estate as an investment. So that only leaves U.S. stocks. Fortunately, there's an entire world out there. And so you can make a more responsible, more educated, and I think much more profitable decision to focus your equity investments outside the United States Find the countries that are making the fewest mistakes, that have the soundest economies, both fiscally and monetarily, and also load up on inflation hedges. Make sure you have exposure to gold, silver, uh, and own companies that are in that commodity space, that own the resources uh, that are going to benefit most from the worldwide inflationary epidemic uh, that we're going to have, and ultimately a fatal epidemic here in the United States. Anthony Mazzillo is in the news again. Remember, he was the head of Countrywide. That was a giant mortgage behemoth that got purchased by Bank of America. And of course, uh, Bank of America ended up paying enormous fines to the U.S. government for a lot of the mortgages that were underwritten or securitized, whatever uh, originated by a Countrywide. And of course, they also had to pay for the bad mortgages securitized by Merrill Lynch because uh, Bank of America acquired both. Although originally, Bank of America made an investment in Countrywide, and then they later bought the entire company. But I remember when they first made the investment on television, I commented on what a stupid idea it was because I said at the time, look, I don't know why they're buying Countrywide. They're going to go bankrupt. Why don't they just wait and pick them up in bankruptcy? I knew the company was going to go bankrupt because I knew the housing bubble was going to burst. And I knew something, of course, that the guys at Bank of America didn't know. I understood more about the company they were buying than they did, even though they had all these analysts who spent all this time studying it and decided to make a bid. Uh, I knew a lot more about the company just based on my understanding of the housing market and of the Fed and understanding that Bank of America executives and countrywide executives, for that matter, didn't have. But just recently, uh, the U.S. government is now getting around to maybe trying to go after Mozilla criminally for the wrongdoing that supposedly went on uh, during the housing bubble. And of course, you know, very few people have been prosecuted. They've, they've, they've pulled out a couple of guys here and there, you know, fall guys, scapegoats, guys that really had very little to do with it. But none of the big time executives of any of the banks have been charged with anything. And now the government is, you know, going after Anthony Mozilla. And, you know, there were some stories about the fact that, well, now, you know, he's, he's in bad health, 
which I don't know that that's a defense, but he recently did an interview in which he basically said, look, I don't, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't have any regrets. I don't think I did anything wrong. I, I, you know, it was just the times. It was just, I didn't change. The world changed and we just went along with it. And to a large degree, I am very sympathetic to what Anthony Mizzou is saying. Because I know what it was like back then. I was a lone voice in the wilderness talking about a housing bubble, warning that real estate prices would fall. And all I got was ridicule. I mean, even personal relationships, friends, family members, nobody, a lot of people didn't want to be around me because I was talking about housing prices going down and everybody thought I was crazy. Everybody said that was impossible. If I tried to tell somebody not to buy a second house or a third house or not because the price would go down, it would just be a huge argument. I just didn't get it. And then they would make fun of me. Look at you, you're renting, you've been saying this nonsense. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. So to say that Anthony Mazzillo should have seen the housing bubble, why? Nobody else did. I mean, nobody else in the industry really. I mean, some people did and they stayed out of the market, but they were few in number. Most people were oblivious to the problems. You know, a lot of people have seen my mortgage banker speech. If you haven't seen it, it's up on YouTube. Just type in Peter Schiff, mortgage bankers. You know, it's, it's a speech I gave in front of 3,000 mortgage bankers in 2006. I wish I had my presentation from 2005 because there I didn't give my own speech. I was on a panel with some of the biggest people in the mortgage and real estate industry. There were like four or five of us. And this was in 2005. So this was the peak of the bubble. And these guys were so optimistic. It was incredible about how housing could only go up, how it was the greatest market ever. And I was saying the same stuff. It's a bubble. It's going to collapse. And it was really an incredible panel because it was like four or five against one. And to hear these executives so blatantly dismiss my warnings and everything I warned happened, right? So to say, well, Mozilla should have known, right? I mean, what was the big problem? The problem mortgages were the adjustable rate mortgages. But is that his fault? No, they all assumed real estate prices could only go up, so there was no risk. And what made the adjustable rate mortgages feasible? It was the Fed. It was the Fed keeping interest rates so low. 1% interest rates is what breathed life into these adjustable rate mortgages. And the other problem was Fannie and Freddie. Why go after Mozilla and not go after, you know, Franklin Raines or any of these guys that were running Fannie and Freddie? Because these morons were putting U.S. taxpayer guarantees on adjustable rate mortgages. And this is what the government was doing. And so how can you blame Anthony Mozilla for basically, you know, eating the candy that the government was waving in front of them? Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, when they guaranteed a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, right, there were certain criteria because they wanted to make sure that the monthly payment was affordable based on your income and your other uh, obligations. Now, when the adjustable rate mortgage came along, what happened was the borrower got a low payment initially for a period of time, one year, two years, three years, they called it teaser rate. And so that initial payment was very low. Now, ultimately, the payments would go up. And if interest rates went up, well, they could go way up, right? So it's possible that you can you know, take out a mortgage where you're paying $1,500 a month for the first few years, and it could end up being $3,000 a month uh, a, a few years later. Well, what Fannie was doing, Fannie and Freddie were doing, they were not making sure that the borrower could actually qualify under the, the higher potential rate. They simply looked at the teaser rate and they said, well, can the guy afford the teaser rate? And if they could afford the teaser rate, regardless of whether they could afford anything higher than the teaser rate, based solely on their ability to afford the teaser rate, the government guaranteed the mortgage. Now, this was ridiculous. It was asinine. In fact, at the time, I would even call up some of these bankers and argue with them because I was living in Orange County and the register would have you know, what it takes to buy a home. And it would say, how much income do you need to buy this house? And the house might have been $900,000. And if you wanted a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, you had to earn a lot more money than you had than if you just would take a five-year arm. But the five-year arm was much riskier for the borrower because if interest rates went up, the monthly payments on that five-year arm five years from now would be much higher than the payments would be on the fixed rate. But they let you qualify for that loan with much lower income.
So I knew this was an accident waiting to happen. It was a disaster. But the, the banks, companies like Countrywide, they didn't care because the government guaranteed these crazy mortgages. So whose fault was it? Was it uh, Mozilla's fault? Or was it the government's fault for putting the guarantee? Because if Mozilla said, you know what, we're not going to do these mortgages because we know eventually they're going to collapse, what would have happened? His competitors would have eaten his lunch. So in order to remain competitive in a highly competitive market, he had to go to the lowest common denominator. Now, you know, there were some banks that didn't go the Mozilla route that said, you know what, we don't care about short-term market share. We're willing to give up a little bit because we want to do what's prudent. Now, had the government not bailed out all these banks, those prudent lenders who sat it out would have been rewarded because they would have picked up the pieces, right? They would have bought up all these uh, failed banks. Instead, the bad actors got bailed out with government money, and so the people that acted responsibly were not rewarded. The moral hazard of all this is never act responsibly. If your competitors are doing something stupid, do something stupid too. Because in the end, they're all going to get bailed out. So they're going to make a lot of money in the short run and they're not going to pay the price in the long run. So you might as well uh, act just as aggressively too. But to say that Mozilla somehow should have seen this bubble, that he should have been another Peter Schiff, that he should have said, I'm not going to make these loans. I know that real estate prices are going to go down. How could he? Why would anybody have expected him to say that? Especially when everybody was a favor. They were all you know, beating the drums for the housing market. The politicians loved it. The bankers loved it. Wall Street loved it. The homeowners loved it. Everybody buying houses with nothing down, with adjustable rate mortgages, interest-only mortgages, they loved it. The fact that they can routinely cash out money from their house and use it to buy a car they couldn't afford, take a vacation they couldn't afford. Everybody loved it. It was a party and nobody wanted to rain on it. To say that Anthony Mozillo should have been the rainmaker is ridiculous. And now to blame it on him is the fall guy. Yes. Did did Anthony Mozillo get rich? Yeah, he got rich. He figured out how to get rich on the housing bubble without even knowing it was a bubble. But a lot of people made money in the housing bubble. He just made more than most. Everybody. I mean, who's pointing the finger at the guy that bought a house he couldn't afford and refinanced it five or six times and bought a couple of cars, took vacations, bought flat screen TVs? I mean, everybody profited to some degree in the short run from the housing bubble. Just because Mozilla figured out how to profit more than other people doesn't mean that he's uh, should be blamed for it. You know, now, if there was actual fraud or something like that that was actually committed, that's a different story. But why single this guy out? You know, certainly, again, you're looking for scapegoats. You're looking for someone to blame. You know, the real blame goes at the Fed. It goes with Alan Greenspan and his cronies. It goes with Congress, Fannie and Freddie, uh, you know, Barney Frank, Christopher Dodd, all these guys. Of course, you know, they don't get punished, right? One other thought I wanted to touch on when I'm talking about the Fed, you know, the Fed came out not too long ago with a study trying to justify saying a college degree is worth it. And of course, I think just like most things that the Fed comes out with, it was just propaganda. It was BS. Obviously, it's the college degrees are the most overpriced uh, assets probably in the world. You know, they're, you know, the government has basically destroyed the value of a college degree while increasing its price. So it's probably one of the worst deals out there uh, as far as financially speaking is to purchase a college degree. But the Federal Reserve came out with a study trying to say why it was good. Well, now the, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York this week came out with a study and said, wait a minute, it's not good for everybody. And they did say that about the bottom 25% of college degree holders, people that graduated from college, if you take a look at what they're earning, they're actually earning less than the typical high school graduate. And in fact, they're employed in jobs that don't require a college degree, where many people doing the same job only have a high school degree. So the Fed now is conceding that for a lot of people, college is not worth it. And obviously, those people shouldn't even be going to college. But of course, the, 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 the president and everybody wants to make sure that there's no child left behind, that everybody goes to college, no matter what they major, no matter what their aptitude, just spend and borrow as much money as you need so you can graduate with a worthless diploma. So you can, so you can have this piece of paper that says that you, that you were present long enough to graduate. But it doesn't mean you learned anything. And even if you learned something, it doesn't mean that, you know, the philosophy that you studied has any relevance to any of the work that you might actually do 
if you're lucky enough to find a job after you graduate. And of course, you know, all these studies, all these studies that purport to show, you know, how much more people earn who have college degrees. The college degree is not why they earn more. It's a coincidental indicator, right? Because people that have college degrees, the people that tend to go to colleges, they also tend to come from more affluent families. They also were brought up in a certain way. They're also more ambitious. Uh, they're, they're, they're more dedicated. Um, they are more goal-oriented. And they're, all, they're also more intelligent. They have higher IQs. So all of these factors are there. They're all present, whether they go to college or not. They don't, you know, you don't lose your intelligence or your drive or your ambition because you, you know, you don't acquire these skills in college. You have these skills, you know, when you enter college. And just because ambitious, intelligent, motivated people from affluent families go to college, well, duh, they're going to make more money when they get out of college. But college isn't the reason they're making the money. It's the, all the other things. It's the connections that they have, or you know, it's their intelligence. Uh, that that's what's responsible for it, not the fact that they've got some kind of degree, degree in some Mickey Mouse liberal arts major. Now, for certain occupations, look, if you want to be a doctor, well, you're probably going to have to go to med school, which means you've got to go to college because you know, in order to get into med school, you got to go to college. Um, if you want to be a lawyer, I guess you got to go to law school. Although once upon a time, you didn't have to go to law school to be a lawyer. You could just learn the law. You know, America's most famous law lawyers, right? Patrick Henry uh, didn't go to law school. Um, you know, uh, most of the founding fathers didn't, you know, they, these guys, some of them went to college, but a lot of them were self-educated. A lot of our wealthiest industrialists, a lot of the richest men in American history. And believe me, they're not Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Adjusted for inflation, the Carnegies, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers were much richer than Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Yet they didn't go to college. They didn't even go to high school, these guys. You know, they just, they just, they were street smart. They, they learned on their own. They were self-educated men. Uh, and of course, today, with the advent of the internet, which didn't exist 100 years ago, you know, when the, you know, these industrialists were educating themselves, uh, it's so much easier now to be self-educated, you know, and just because you have a diploma doesn't mean you, you learned anything. You know, it just means you were there, right? When you're learning on your own, you're actually learning. You're absolutely absorbing information and you're learning things that are relevant to your life, to what you're doing, to your occupation, right? You study on your own and you can have access. One of the reasons that people used to go to college was because they had all the books, all the best libraries were at college universities. You got everybody has a library in the palm of their hand. Your smartphone can, you know, you got a library there. So there's there's never been less reason to go to college. The degrees have never been less valuable, yet they're more expensive than ever. So all of these surveys that show college graduates earning more than non-college graduates, in most cases, the college degree has nothing to do with the disparity, right? It's all the other factors. If you took two individuals from similar socioeconomic backgrounds, right, and they had the same IQ. They did just as well in high school, the same grades, you know, were members of the same clubs, had the same extracurricular activities or, you know, similar, the same after school jobs If you know, they were still able to get one because the minimum wage didn't take away their, you know, after school job, right? And then, so you factor all that out and then one kid goes to college and one kid skips college. Now let's see who earns more. In fact, it might be that the one that skipped college earns more. Maybe he skipped college because he had the confidence in his own abilities. He didn't need college. Maybe he got a great job offer like that guy. I was just read an article about a guy who had a summer internship uh, out of high school at, at Google, 18 year old kid. And then at the end of the internship, they said, Hey, we'll give you a full-time job. He said, great. I'm not going to college. Why should he? Now, is that guy going to earn less than his buddies that, that spent four years in college? Probably not, because by the time his friends graduated from college, he probably would have been promoted a couple of times. Who knows how much money this guy's going to earn? And you know what? He's not going to have any debt because he didn't have to borrow any money because he didn't go to college. And where do you think you're going to learn more money? Let's say this guy wants to be in the computer industry, wants to be a computer engineer, a software programmer. Where is this guy going to learn more? For spending four years at Google right, with some of the best and brightest programmers and computer science guys around or in a college classroom learning from a professor that doesn't know enough to get a job at Google. Because all the best guys, right, they don't 
They, they, they do. They don't teach. Right. That's the old expression. Those who can do those who can't teach. Then I, you know, Woody Allen said those who can't teach, teach Jim. And those who can't teach Jim were assigned to his school. Right? I think that was from Annie Hall. But you're going to earn a lot. You're going to learn a lot more from people who are doing stuff because they're really good at it than from people who are teaching it because they're not that good at it. Now, of course, not all teachers. Some teachers are retired. They actually were in the industry and they, you know, they could do it. Now they're, they're teaching later on. But most people do not fall into that. And of course, even if you learn something, if you go into school and you learn something about computer science or programming, by the time you learn it, it's already obsolete because they're teaching stuff that was maybe it was there two or three years ago. It's always evolving. So if you want to be on the cutting edge, you don't want to be learning stuff in a textbook that's probably obsolete by the time you get it. You want to be in the real world learning the state-of-the-art technology, the state-of-the-art state of technology stuff so you know don't believe you know the federal reserve comes out with all kinds of propaganda about everything and the fact that they even have to put out some studies trying to validate or justify a college degree is probably more proof that you don't need one most people don't need to go to college the vast majority of people who are in college are wasting their time and either their money or our money because they're they're borrowing money and they're going to default on these loans and so the taxpayers have to put up the tab and who benefits? The universities, the colleges, the educational bureaucracy, the tenured professors, the administrators who are feeding off the trough, a public trough. They are getting rich on all this educational spending. Meanwhile, the kids learn nothing. We impoverish their parents. In fact, we impoverish the kids because they end up graduating with all this debt and they've wasted their formative years where they could have been in the workforce learning stuff. Instead, they're getting drunk uh, and, and learning nothing at U.S. Uh, universities. Well, that's it for today's program. I hope you enjoyed the Peter Schiff Show in this new podcast format. Don't forget to share the show with your friends. Make sure and tell people about it. If you're listening on iTunes or, hey, even if you're not, you can write a favorable review of the program on iTunes and maybe get more people to be interested. In fact, if you're in any internet chat rooms or uh, in any kind of social media type discussions, mention the new Peter Schiff Show uh, podcast. Try to help uh, get more people to listen to it. Don't forget, of course, all my social media sites. You can friend me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel. The more ways that you can connect with me and help me connect with other people, the more we can spread the message of freedom and liberty and hopefully help educate the American public and unbrainwash them from what they've learned in public schools and what they hear in conventional media sources. Again, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, stay tuned for future Peter Schiff shows coming at you in this new podcast form. Bye for now. <laughs>